Very welcome to have Dr. Ben and Pete back on the show. And um, again, it astounds me uh, where he has spent all of the years of his postdoctoral life uh, researching. And uh, this other subject tonight, carbon monoxide, is something that he said uh, he was he was researching 30 years ago and started doing work towards uh, better understanding of carbon monoxide and its implications in uh, toxicology and uh, pathogenesis of disease. So, um, Dr. M. Pete, thanks for joining us again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there were a, a couple topics that uh, directed me towards uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, I had previously uh, been very interested in Otto Warburg's theory of cancer, and one of his experiments to uh, study the respiratory enzyme involved poisoning that enzyme with carbon monoxide. Okay. And uh, so I was aware that the most interesting enzyme of all uh, happened to be specifically sensitive to uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And uh, he found that light uh, restored the activity of that uh, enzyme, and uh, that came back up in, in my attention uh, when I was studying the toxic effects of the long northern dark winters, uh, lack of light exposure, uh, leaving uh, this enzyme susceptible to poisoning. Okay. Uh, I, I think without uh, cutting you short, Dr. Pete, just um, uh, the other thing that strikes me is that um, we get callers who have listened for the first time with this show that goes out every month, and uh, I wouldn't want anyone listening to be deprived of uh, getting a little bit of background information from you. So I appreciate you uh, launching straight into the topic, but would you um, just give people an idea of your academic and professional background? Um, I uh, went from uh, teaching uh, linguistics and uh, humanities subjects uh, right in the graduate school in, in biology uh, because I wanted to understand how the brain works when it does things such as uh, making language or art and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was studying nerve biology at, at the beginning and uh, found that that was a very dogmatic uh, area, uh, I think, at every university, but uh, including the University of Oregon where I started uh, in graduate school in mm -hmm. 1968. Okay. And so within about uh, six months, I had switched over to the other end of the organism, reproductive physiology and how aging affects that. Right. Okay, because I think that's uh, another important point about uh, this topic that uh, I'd like you to expand on here. Um, aging in the process of degeneration and cell de 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 degeneration, excuse me, um, is uh, I think probably becoming more of a, uh, a heard topic on people's lips and in the papers and in magazines and in the popular press. And Alzheimer's disease being one of those uh, neurodegenerative disease diseases that we're hearing much more of nowadays um, to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's uh, and collectively that neurodegenerative collective uh, of diseases. This is something that relates fairly intimately with carbon monoxide, doesn't it? That there is um, many different processes that cause or have been shown to exacerbate the formation of Alzheimer's in any given population. But um, Yeah, they find that old brains in general have uh, increased amounts of the enzyme that produces uh, carbon monoxide in the tissues. Okay. Any tissue can produce it, but uh, stress increases the amount of the enzyme. And uh, so the more stress there is, <clears throat> the more risk there is of uh, poisoning itself. And uh, not only increasing age increases the enzyme, uh, but they find that uh, schizophrenic brains have increased amounts of the enzyme making carbon monoxide. Okay. Uh, Alzheimer's brains uh, and in Parkinson's brains in the particular area affected by the Parkinson's disease, uh, they see an increased amount of the enzyme. And uh, in uh, 
breaking down the heme, which is its basic purpose, it releases iron as well as uh, carbon monoxide, and the deposits of iron are found in the Parkinson's uh, brain in that area. Let's just, uh, let's just refresh for people that who, who um, probably want to understand this process a little more. The enzyme, the, the enzyme first off is heme oxygenase, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and uh, just give us that, a run through of, of that what it, that's doing. It, it attaches oxygen atoms to the heme uh, molecule, which is what uh, carries oxygen in hemoglobin. Right. Uh, and... Uh, the heme molecule is what binds iron, and right. that in turn binds oxygen. Right. But uh, carbon monoxide is similar enough electrically to oxygen that it can outbind right. uh, oxygen and, and displace stick it to the yeah. hemoglobin in its place. Right. So we're, we can be exposed to carbon monoxide ex- from external sources like burning fuel. But you're saying that this is also happening inside our bodies and inside our cells due to an enzyme? Um, yeah, it's uh, just the only way the, the body has to get rid of uh, unused or inappropriately released hemoglobin. Uh, the, uh, Any time a tissue is injured and uh, leaks blood, the hemoglobin is potentially very toxic in itself right. and, and sort of detoxify this hemoglobin, which would uh, act as an enzyme, uh, just wildly consuming oxygen. The, the enzyme is there in every injured tissue that tends to bleed or release right. a <laughs> heme to destroy the heme and uh, turn it into things that can be recycled, right. uh, such as the iron atom and the carbons from the heme molecule. So this this enzyme has a function in damaged tissue to help mop up the waste products, but in um, certain brain situations like we've been describing, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, it's in excess amounts. Um, yeah, apparently because of chronic stress. Right. And uh, another... Uh, brain situation in which they find it exactly associated with the pro- problematic uh, cells in the brain, uh, 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 multiple sclerosis in the plaques, uh, they find the increased amounts of the yeah. enzyme right. making uh, carbon monoxide. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I had uh, gotten away from the, uh, the cancer carbon monoxide uh, connection for several years because uh, I couldn't find anyone willing to listen to, <laughs> to the idea that it was such a neat idea to explain how the Barberg cancer theory works. Okay. Uh, but I came back to it in the 90s, uh, uh, applying it to uh, multiple sclerosis uh, because the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are very similar to those of multiple sclerosis. Yeah, go ahead and describe them. Um, well, uh, clots tend to form uh, in the brain, uh, and uh, every place there's a clot, the blood vessels become leaky, and uh, proteins leak out into the brain and are part of the inflammatory process. Mm-hmm. And uh, the carbon monoxide uh, activates those same processes, tendency to clot, uh, definite tendency of blood vessels to become leaky okay. and uh, uh, let things inappropriately seep out so that any time you have a, a situation of leaky blood vessels, injured liver, for example, leaking its enzymes, mm-hmm. inflamed muscles, uh, leaking enzymes and proteins, heart attack, leaking right. its substances, uh, you find heme oxygenase and carbon monoxide there making the cells more permeable and leaky. Now, am I right in thinking that carbon monoxide is actually produced by tumors too? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and in uh, transplanting uh, a tumor into an animal, uh, they found that uh, it had many toxic effects on the animal. Mm-hmm. For years they talked about a, a toxic hormone 
or a cancer hormone. Right. Uh, and in one set of experiments, they gave uh, a chemical uh, to the animal receiving the uh, tumor implant, a chemical that would inhibit uh, heme oxygenase and stop the formation of carbon monoxide right. and to stop the toxic effects yeah, of the transplant. Because huh. um, I think we can get into that a little bit later on. There is, uh, they're looking at... Um, this is potential research, but you can see some pitfalls in some of the approach that they want to use. So, so is, is that for a potential um, anti-cancer treatment? Um, yeah, there are several groups working on it. Um, they can uh, stop cancer growth, like for a week at a time, with an injection of, of one of the chemicals that just turns off uh, heme oxygenase, and uh, they're designing. Uh, many chemicals that will do it, for example, uh, reverse structure RNA molecules that uh, interfere with the production of the enzyme very specifically. So then this would have uh, possible clinical applications with Alzheimer's and Parkinson as well, then, if, 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 if it's actually turning off that enzyme. Yeah, all of the degenerative stress-related diseases, uh, cancer and, and mm. the brain aging Atherosclerosis. Mm-hmm. And arthritis involves uh, excess carbon monoxide, too. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's just go back for uh, the, the benefit of the listeners using uh, listening to this program right now who perhaps don't have the same kind of scientific background so they can understand a little more about heme oxygenase. You mentioned that the, this enzyme, heme oxygenase, is part of our body and every cell uh, has the ability to um, utilize uh, or break down rather the products of uh, hemoglobin into, you mentioned iron and carbon monoxide and then there's a pigment called bilirubin. So this is happening, our blood cells are turning over every 90 days and the spleen mops up these blood cells constantly, uh, breaking down the red blood cell into byproducts like the hemoglobin and carbon monoxide and bilirubin 24-7. So this is the process that is happening in our bodies anyway. Um, But what's the, um, the, the mechanism behind which we're protected from the carbon monoxide? design feature is that having it all happen in the spleen uh, keeps it away from your brain and heart and okay. reproductive organs yeah. and so on. <coughs> so it's a, what about those people who perhaps have had a, a splenectomy and it's been taken out or it's been ruptured or damaged, they don't have one? I, <coughs> I don't know uh, exactly what the consequences are, but you would think that it would expose their other uh, tissues more to uh, yeah. effects of chronic stress. Huh. Okay. Well, so, what about when someone has like an enlarged spleen? Then are they just able to do that much better? Because usually enlarged spleens are indicating liver disease or other problems. Um, yeah, I, I imagine that um, as long as it's confined to the spleen, uh, that's the, the main purpose of the organ is to, is to keep it happening somewhere that the uh, carbon monoxide has a chance to diffuse away in the bloodstream right. before it gets to the organs. Yeah. Dilute okay. it. Uh, just the, the main purpose of the uh, the talk and this discussion is that we'll get onto that as well in a little while, um, is that um, propane, uh, if it's burnt incompletely and the byproducts of that incomplete combustion are carbon monoxide and uh, environmental pollution from uh, traffic exhaust uh, high in carbon monoxide. Um, that's basically what we're looking at smoking, yeah, as another good example of carbon monoxide exposure. And so even wood smoke too, right, Dr. Pete? <coughs> um, yeah, uh, a smoke? bad uh, stove or fireplace can put out a huge amount of uh, carbon monoxide. And uh, even if you have a perfectly adjusted gas stove, if you put a cold pan down on the burner so that the flame touches it, uh, cooling the flame is going to make it release carbon monoxide. So tell me, you had a recent uh, a recent encounter, or somebody somebody you had you were consulting with someone, and uh, they were lucky lucky enough to get their hands on a good carbon monoxide meter. So just just talk about that a little. Um, they they were all having uh, symptoms, and uh, they noticed that they were worse in the winter when they, the house was tightly closed up, 
and uh, they happened to have access to a, a very sensitive meter that would uh, measure down to a few parts per million and uh, found that uh, just 15 minutes of having the stove on, uh, the uh, burners were producing 15 parts per million and the oven uh, 29 parts per million, no, 18 and 29. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, it's a matter of uh, how long you keep breathing it uh, because uh, if it fluctuates, then you have a chance to breathe it out as well as breathe it in. Mm-hmm. And in uh, one particular experiment with rats, they exposed the rats to the supposedly upper safe limit for human exposure, Which for is example, <laughs> in cities, 50 parts 50, per million. Right, right. okay. And um, in just one hour of exposure, uh, the rats' brains were structurally damaged. So were they getting infarcts or some other kind um, of damage? Or? No, no, much no, less. Much less than that, yeah. Small cellular changes. Right, so it was the, the beginning hour. of something bad, yeah. something worse. And that's what you mentioned is the level in a lot of cities, right? 50 I mean, parts per million. Uh, yeah, it comes and goes, but uh, they saw uh, permanent changes in prolonged exposure to even lower amounts in the animals, uh, 30 parts per million, for example. So the average housewife who spends all her time cooking <laughs> over the stove. No, sorry, that's not the average housewife. <laughs> it could be exposed to a lot more than um, healthy levels because gas stoves could be emitting a large quantity of carbon monoxide. Yeah, and the symptoms are very rarely uh, associated with carbon monoxide poisoning mm-hmm. because uh, okay. that's thought of as... You traditionally as, think of the person who's shut himself in a garage with a... A rubber pipe coming out of the exhaust pipe into the garage, right? Yeah, yeah. and for many years, uh, doctors thought only in terms of the blood being saturated with right. carbon monoxide and not being able to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Mm-hmm. But the, act, the carbon monoxide goes right into all of the tissues, and we've got many, many enzymes that use uh, heme. It isn't just mm-hmm. the blood and myoglobin. But, uh, for example, the steroids, uh, the enzymes that make steroids, uh, use the heme group. And so uh, the, um, the most uh, intense symptom of, of getting your tissue saturated is that you uh, poison the, the energy-producing enzyme. But very moderate uh, amounts of chronic poisoning will shut down your ability to produce uh, steroids so that the testosterone level, for example, falls uh, with chronic uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. But interestingly, the uh, adrenal uh, corticosteroids uh, are increased under the stimulation uh, because the adrenals are designed to recognize a stress emergency situation, which Mm -hmm carbon monoxide is, but the the actual enzymes that produce the bulk of steroids uh, are blocked by carbon monoxide. Okay, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Carbivore 91.1 FM, and from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's topic of carbon monoxide. Uh, The number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911. Or if you live outside the area, 1-800-KMUD-RAD. Okay, so we're joined by Dr. Raymond Pete, um, and he's uh, explaining some of the mechanisms behind uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and uh, we're just covering some of the some of the sources of which perhaps we probably haven't really considered that much. So I think the uh, the thing with stoves, the cook stoves, I never really, I mean, I always recognise the fact that a uh, a poorly adjusted flame was probably the main cause of carbon monoxide emission from propane burning appliances, and that the uh, 
presence of an orangey type flame rather than a blue or a, a kind of violet flame was indicative and, and then soot and that kind of thing, sooty deposits around the uh, the nozzle <coughs> were pretty diagnostic of incomplete combustion. But you're saying that if you can put a pan of water, a cold pan of water on the stove, actually on the burner, there's sufficient cooling there to cool the flame to the point where there, could be, there will be incomplete combustion and carbon monoxide generated. Um, yeah, and typically you see a little bit of the flame turning yellow where it hits the pan. Right, exactly, yeah, no, I think we've all seen that. Yeah, no, I've seen that. But the other point about this um, carbon monoxide emissions from propane stoves is that people's houses are becoming more and more airtight. I know our house is right, very airtight, airtight <laughs> so <laughs> it's um, you know, maybe the older drafty houses a little bit leaking out of your stove. It was diluted with plenty of wind. <laughs> plenty of air. <laughs> so do you think we're going to see more Alzheimer's now, Dr. P? Continue with everybody's uh, well, we are airtight seeing, houses. We are seeing it. It's just whether know, or not it's coming on. from propane stoves or not. Uh, but the first symptoms are often so light, people just think they have a chronic uh, cold, or sometimes uh, people get uh, anxious or depressed. Uh, uh, some people have uh, uh, crawling sensations on their skin, uh, muscle cramps, heart arrhythmia. Okay. Uh, practically any wow. symptom you can think of, uh, it's uh, well known uh, as a, a sign of carbon monoxide poisoning, but it's just very rare for anyone to think of it when they have the symptoms. Yeah. Or what about those heaters that you see in a lot of people's houses? Uh, space heaters or something. Yeah, that yeah. are actually <clears throat> gas-powered heaters. I guess maybe they're more popular in England than they are here. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of people used to have them even without uh, vents. <laughs> well, these ones in England, people that yeah, people right. have in their house don't have any vents. Mm. <laughs> it just sits in the <laughs> front room, radiating uh, heat. Yeah, the same as uh, a gas cooking stove. They figured it was... So an, another another thing to cover too is the uh, government regulations concerning the uh, presence of carbon monoxide detectors in houses now. I think probably for a few years, they, they always first things it was smoke detectors and then it was carbon monoxide detectors. It, describe briefly, because I've seen the limits and the statutory regulations, government regulations and industry regulations that have set these limits. Just describe them for us a little bit. Uh, the, uh, years ago, I, I bought one of the cheap meters and... Uh, was uh, testing it on various things and uh, nothing would register and so I put it in the garage with the car running and left it for I guess half an hour and still nothing happened. And, uh, there, it wasn't strong enough. I, I oh, learned that uh, the government requires or the industry uh, and government uh, require that they not sound an alarm unless uh, the concentration is reaching uh, the life-threatening point. Uh, and uh, so uh, if it's a low level, uh, below 50 parts per million, I, uh, one of the standards says it has to uh, stay at that concentration for 48 hours right. steadily before the alarm can sound. Wow. And, and so uh, what would that do to your brain if you had a 50 parts per million steadily for 24 hours, it, <laughs> 48 hours? Uh, yeah, I think they they uh, require the alarm to sound after uh, something like 30 to 60 minutes of, of a 50 part per million concentration. Uh, mm -hmm. They've got the charts published, but yeah. um, it, it's uh, definitely not a healthy concentration, but it, they don't want you bothering the... Uh, fire department uh, any time <laughs> you're just getting a, a burst of 70 parts per million wow. because it won't kill you soon. Or, right. or complaining to your your uh, range manufacturer. Yeah. So what about this meter that you said is very, very sensitive? What What's the name of this meter? Um, I have oh. seen it on the Internet. I don't know the brand. Uh, one company that makes them is KID. Kiddie, K I D D E. Oh, right. They're, they're manufacturers of uh, smoke alarms, too. Um, and uh, I think it was their company that had one for $340 that oh. uh, actually registered down in parts per million, which mm -hmm. is 
exactly useful because right and in real time y- yeah um, <coughs> you you want to know uh, for example if you uh, breathe out uh, a healthy person will make less than one part per million exhalation mm-hmm. if they're very sick and under stressed under stress they might go up to uh, five parts per million mm-hmm. just from their yeah. internal production and I know I'm pretty sure we have a caller on the line, but let's let's give it a give it a couple of seconds here because it's not 7:30 yet, and I want to make sure that we can keep covering more more material. The thing that uh, struck me earlier when I was looking at some of this was that smoking exposes a smoker to about 500 parts per million carbon monoxide from a cigarette. Yeah, so, in that little stream. Right. So uh, let's let's try to be comparative here and. Um, in terms of uh, incomplete combustion from a propane stove, um, and you well, said 28 uh, parts per million for the oven and 18 well, for the... If, if you had that concentration of the cigarette in your room air, you would right. be dead <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> right. At 500 parts per million. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, because you're breathing quarts of air for every puff of smoke. <sighs> Right, so it's very diluted. So what do you think, what would that, I wonder what a quart to a puff would work out at as a, a concentration? Uh, probably 30, 40, 50, somewhere wow. around that, yeah. a, a bad. That's, that's, uh, so that's you, so standing around your oven could be just as bad as smoking cigarettes? <laughs> uh, definitely in, in some houses. If the oven's right, not let's, well let's adjusted. Let's take this first caller if they're still there. Hi, you're on the air? Hello. Hi. Oh, can barely hear you. Okay, well, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, good. Go ahead. A uh, question for Raymond Pete, uh, probably two or a couple, but uh, I um, I recall a couple years ago he was talking about uh, he had something with thyroid and staying off clear oils, and uh, he was curing liver, people with liver problems, say he had cirrhosis or right. hepatitis or something. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yep. What what would be your question? Uh, what was it again? The the uh, what oils are you? Something about uh, thyroid, and uh, I'd like to know what uh, to, to refurbish my my memory, my mind as as to what his what was he recommends as a liver cleanse, and I recall that it was something with thyroid medicines, no clear oils, coconut and butter only. And uh, no alcohol or some blah blah blah. Okay, Doctor P, did you get did you catch that? Um, yeah, the, the um, thyroid is the uh, essential thing for uh, energizing uh, the burning of any fuel. And uh, if your thyroid function is low, your liver is is in a way the first organ to feel it because uh, the liver stores sugar. And if you're wasting energy, your liver fails to store sugar and and, uh, uh, becomes uh, inefficient eventually, uh, fibrotic and so on. People with thyroid, I I knew a woman in New York, she she went from really real thin to super fat, so she had her thyroid gland removed. And she had an awful scar in her throat. didn't help her at all. But anyway, I'm not overweight or anything. It's just that uh, I've had hepatitis in the past and I'm afraid I may you know I, I I used to drink for you know over 20 years all day long so I'm wondering how I can what is this thyroid medicine called um it, it's um there are two main chemicals that are the, called the thyroid hormone one is thyroxin and the other one is T3 or triiodothyronine, and the traditional uh, product was just dried thyroid gland. And, you actually uh, take the gland itself? Um, yeah, people used to eat the whole animal. I heard you on the radio, so maybe four years ago now, and you're saying take thyroid. It's like, gee, I don't have any thyroid glands in my you know, refrigerator. What is this guy talking about? I know um, in, in England you can still go to the butcher and they're called, they call them sweetbreads and there's thymus and thyroid gland. Sweetbreads, okay, that's swell. But see, I haven't eaten meat since I was like 17. I'm like, well, you can't get them here anyways. It's just a factoid I thought I'd bring up. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, so. Make a long story short. Long story short, what should I do here? Um, the main 
dietary things that suppress the thyroid function are the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And uh, that's why I've mentioned uh, the importance of uh, saturated fats such as coconut oil and butter uh, and sugar as a way to make your own fat uh, to avoid the uh, dietary uh, oils such as safflower, soy, corn oil, and so on, which are anti-thyroid. So those are all the... Oil. So in other words, I don't really necessarily... My, I'm sure my thyroid is probably functioning just fine. I have a sneaking suspicion. I mean, are you... Dr. Or Ray Pete, are you the guy on the Internet I was trying to get hold of where it's a photo of you and you look like all like you've been working out or something? Is that you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, this could not be my guy. This, is, <laughs> this does not sound like Ray Pete to me. I mean, but there's another Ray... I, I spoke to you on the Internet of, uh, several years ago, but I can't find you anymore on the Internet. Well, his website is raypeat.com, R-A-Y-P-E-A-T.com. Right. Okay. Groovy. Yeah, so it's all the liquid oils. You, so it wasn't the – you remembered correctly everything apart from it was liquid oils, not clear oils. It's all liquid oh, yeah, oils. Yeah, yeah, liquid oils. Not Avoiding all liquid no oils, oil. yeah, only no do butter and coconut okay. oil. And so then I have to lay off alcohol completely, uh, any kind of drugs, crap shit stuff, pardon my language. And – Adequate protein. My policy is if you swear on air, I take you off. So we have one more caller waiting now. What do I do about thyroid again? Okay, one one more caller. You're on the air? Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about something Dr. Pete brought up before. Um, he was talking about hypothyroid and how it can be improved in, like, warm, sunny weather. Um I'm just wondering, is that beneficial because it's temporarily like masking the symptoms, or if that has a long-term corrective effect on the thyroid? Uh, just getting warm uh, lowers the stress hormones, and so it gives your body a chance to recover. But uh, if you haven't changed your diet that was causing the problem, uh, then uh, cold weather or other stress uh, will tend to bring back the hypothyroidism. But isn't it also that the decreased daylight hours, Dr. Pete, um, make your thyroid hormone less able to be picked up by your cells? Um, Yeah, the the mitochondria that I was talking about, the the, the toxic effects of darkness, uh, the thyroid is trying to uh, keep those mitochondria functioning And during the darkness, the various toxins, including carbon monoxide, uh, interrupt the function of the mitochondrion, and that means it blocks the function of the thyroid. But if you increase your thyroid, you can compensate a little bit for that disruption during the darkness. In animal experiments, they found that uh, removing a rat's thyroid gland uh, they would have to give four times as much supplement in the winter as in the summer uh, because of the uh, increased stress of the dark days. And when I tested it on myself, it was uh, exactly four times requirement uh, difference according to the season. Yeah, and if you asked okay. your doctor, they wouldn't recommend that you increase your thyroid medication four times in the winter months versus the summer. So something that you have to... Um, follow your own symptoms. Right. So the, it's almost as if the thyroid is being wasted on trying to um, help the mitochondria when the when the when you're getting less light. I guess. Um, like you're, you're producing a similar amount. It's just being wasted on trying to keep your energy up with these stressors. Um, yeah, it does. Um, it does spend more of the uh, thyroid substance and get it thrown off. But if you have your uh, tissue well saturated with the safe nutrients rather than the uh, dangerous polyunsaturated oils, uh, your mitochondria are much tougher. Uh, They've found that you can remove the mitochondria from an animal that hasn't uh, had those uh, unsaturated fats and mitochondria 
survive in the test tube much longer and are more vigorous. So it's the polyunsaturated fats that make the mitochondria so susceptible to injury. Do you, do, you, do you think, Dr. Pete, that this is because of the, uh, uh, the lipid membrane that the mitochondria is surrounded by is made up of saturated oils that don't oxidize like polyunsaturates, and that's why they last well, longer? Well, yeah, the, the very structure, uh, you, you can extract the, uh, all of the fat from a, a cell, and you still have the mitochondrial structure in, a, in shape because it's mostly protein okay. that gives the structure, and those proteins are tightly interacting with uh, fats, and a lot of those are unsaturated. And so if you get too many unsaturated ones, uh, they oxidize and damage the proteins. Right. So it's, it's the mixture of protein and fat. And just to explain for our listeners who might not have heard of mitochondria before, that's what we call the powerhouse of our cell. It's what produces energy. So without mitochondria, you'd have no energy. You wouldn't be alive. But it's actually the part of the cell that makes all your energy. And thyroid hormone helps bring oxygen to the cell and helps to activate the mitochondria. So it's all linked to having a cell function properly. Thyroid and adequate oxygen and the mitochondria producing the energy called ATP. And adequate light is part of it. Okay. All right, thanks for that caller. That um, reminds me, we've got one more caller, but quickly let me uh, let me just ask you this, Dr. Pete. Um, I know you mentioned um, Otto Warburg in 1926 and his work on cancer and um, defective respiratory enzymes. You said that um, when when these when these animals had been poisoned with carbon monoxide, the animals could recover completely if they was and I've, we've and you've mentioned this many times before in, in context of radiation and other damaging uh, substances but these animals could be restored basically by having this bright orange light in this instance there's red work too but orange light shined on them they they could be re reactivated if you like uh, yeah, barberg was just using uh tissues uh, okay. isolated from okay. animals Got but it. russians were the ones who um, used whole animals. <laughs> okay. and, uh, they would give them a killing dose of gamma rays, and uh, if they very quickly, in, within an hour, uh, flooded them with red light, uh, it inactivated the um, effects of the radiation. Right. So it, it wasn't the radiation itself. It was a cascade of chemical events right. that could be interrupted by the red light. And... Uh, when you get sunburned, uh, part of that cascade of events is the production of carbon monoxide. Mm-hmm. All right. So it was Otto, Warb- Otto Warburg did tissues. He, he was uh, experimenting with tissues rather than animals. Okay. Uh, we have another caller on the uh, line, so let's take the next caller. Hello. Oh, you're, you're on the air. Oh, thank you. I, I wanted to go back to that the topic of the polyunsaturated fats, and I wondered if they feed chickens, for example, even organic ones, lots of, say, cotton seed meal or something, even if it's organic, are, are we eating uh, organic protein, you know, chicken or beef or anything, even if, if they've been raised on grains and everything, are we getting a secondary exposure to a lot of polyunsaturated fats? Um, yeah, any animal that isn't a ruminant will uh, express in its tissues uh, pretty exactly the balance of fats in its food, and uh-huh. that includes people and pigs and chickens. And ducks uh, and geese and turkeys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, but uh, sheep and cows and camels, for example, uh, will produce uh, milk that has almost about 98% of the bad fats have been uh, destroyed by bacteria in their rumens uh, so that uh, it's 98% monounsaturated or uh, uh, saturated or the um, trans fat variations uh, conjugated linoleic acid, for example, which is uh, actively being sold as a, an anti-cancer uh, 
weight loss agent, but you find it naturally in butter and milk. And also that would include venison, elk, antelope, mule deer, moose. You know, and all those, all those animals have a fat that congeal at room temperature. They have ruminant uh, processes working. Yeah, because they have more than one yeah. stomach to digest I and think. to convert But when the you fat. see uh, chickens, they have such soft, almost runny fat these days. Right, because yeah. it's very polyunsaturated because they're eating corn and soy meal. It's the same with uh, pig fat. Uh, when my grandmother used it, it was a solid like butter. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, even most researchers have been calling it a saturated fat now for 50 years. And uh, a couple of years ago, someone bothered to analyze it and found that it was 30% PUFA. Wow. Uh-huh. Well, we, just, um, we had some friends who butchered a pig that was fed... Uh, mostly apples <laughs> and vegetables from <laughs> and from vegetable the, from the farm. green waste from yeah, their farm, the farm, and they had a seventy pound pig, and thirty pounds of it was fat and forty pounds of it was meat, and it was and all it was solid. <laughs> so that would be like good quality yeah. lard. Yeah, that yeah. would be exactly. That's where your lard would come from for baking pastries and other. other That's goodies. the way to make good eggs too. Uh, feed them uh, lots of vegetable matter. Right. Because the sugars will cause the animals to make saturated fat. So if you feed, you know, your animals your excess fruit in the fall, which is what was happening with this pig, mm-hmm. then then they'll tend to make saturated fat out of that sugar. Well, so, thank you for your answers. That's very interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your call. Yeah. Bye. Okay, so we have another caller on the air, so let's take this next one. Hello. Hi, you're on the air? Yeah, um... Uh, you know, uh, people are... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, people tend to be really skittish about butter. Uh, you know, I, I hear all the time people saying, Oh, I mustn't eat butter because I'm afraid of the cholesterol and it's going to clog my arteries and give me a heart attack. And yet you guys are always talking about how butter is good for you. Mm-hmm. What's with all that? Dr. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone through this several times. It's let's brainwashing. Go it yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just hard to example, overcome. Uh, uh, They wanted to sell margarine. A a researcher in India noticed that in his area where people eat a lot of butter, uh, alcoholics uh, didn't get uh, hepatitis and cirrhosis. And so he did a study with rats and fed them butter and lots of alcohol, and they didn't get hepatitis and cirrhosis. And uh, a group has been researching that. Uh, now for about 25 years, uh, showing that uh, fish oil and uh, unsaturated vegetable oil interact with a little bit of alcohol to uh, activate iron, uh, causing oxidative damage, liver inflammation, and fibrosis. But if you have practically a, a un- unsaturated fat-free diet, uh, alcohol is really pretty harmless. And didn't they do that study in Chicago as well 30 years ago you told me about? Um, yeah, it, uh, uh, Nanji is the name of, <clears throat> of the main researcher, N-A-N-J-I. Okay, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMD Garberville 91.1 FM, and from now until 8 o'clock at the end of the show, uh, you're invited to call in with any questions related or unrelated to the uh, month's topic of carbon monoxide poisoning and its various ramifications uh, number like I said if you live here is 923-3911 or if you live outside the area 1-800-KMUD-RAD and we have Dr. Raymond Pete with us um, and he's the person who's behind all the science so if you would like to ask him any questions now's your chance uh, we do have another caller on the air so let's get this next caller hi you're on the air Good. Hi. is it I that's on the air yes go ahead Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? I'm not hearing anyone. Okay, we can hear you. Oh, you you should be there. Are you there, caller? Yes. Yes, Yes, you're on the air. Hello, caller. Can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Um, Yes, I had a question. Um, I've had uh, quintuple bypass surgery, and um, I was introduced to a diet called the Dean Ornish diet, and in that diet, it 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 claims that you know fat is good for you in limitations, but 
saturated fat itself is no good at all and that you should steer away from any saturated fat. I, I, so, and again, again I, I realize you've addressed this numerous times. You just mentioned that with the last caller. But is there, is there something I'm, it's, I'm, I'm just so confused at this point? You know, it's a, it's the Dean Ornish diet, from my understanding, is basically a, a, a vegetarian diet, although he does call for the, um, uh, fat from the, you know, from fish, uh, to be added to that diet. But beyond that, it's uh, a no meat, no dairy diet. Doctor P, what, what would you have? What would you have to say? Um, uh, that there is now a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, Chris Masterjohn, for example, has some very good review articles uh, dealing with topics like that. Uh, I've got a couple articles on cholesterol on my website. Okay. So Chris Masterjohn, if, if the caller um, heard that, you should Google Chris Masterjohn and then uh, Masterjohn. And then um, Dr. Raymond Pete's website is www.raypeat.com. And he has uh, a lot of articles there that you can read that might explain some of the confusion. But he specifically said he has uh, yeah. articles on cholesterol. Specifically. And basically, research has shown that if you're eating the unsaturated fatty acids, those go rancid in your bloodstream and damage your arteries. And then your body needs to stop that um, massive free radical reaction where it's consuming oxygen and going rancid. And so your body puts a cholesterol bandage over the rancid oil. So Japanese scientists have found when they remove that cholesterol bandage, they find a plaque of oxidized omega-6 oils. And there's lots of research showing that this is actually what causes uh, damage to the arteries, and it's not at all saturated fats because saturated fats are so stable and would not create a free radical reaction like that. Okay, I think we have uh, two more callers on the air, so let's take the next uh, caller. You're on the air? Yeah, I, I'm calling back because uh, when, when I asked about cholesterol, you talked about alcohol and liver. And uh, what I want to know is about specifically butter. Uh, is butter bad for your heart and your cholesterol or no, not? Not at because all, no, not at a all. A lot of people are very afraid to eat butter because they think it's going to clog their arteries. What's the reality? Okay, did you want to answer that, Dr. Pete? Um, yeah, the same thing that applies to the liver applies exactly to the arteries, except the arteries are the first place that the uh, unsaturated uh, oxidized fats will injure. Right. They come out of your... Uh, I understand that it's bad to do this to the unsaturated fat, but why do people think that butter and, you know, and animal fat is going to clog their arteries? Uh, because of 50 years of propaganda right. from the seed oil industry, basically. So you're basically saying that unsaturated fat will clog your arteries quicker than butter. Yeah. Exactly. And when it's when the seed oil industry was unable to sell their oils to the paint companies, and that because the paint companies started buying their oils from the petroleum industry, they needed to market their corn and soy oil to to humans because there was no other market for it. And that's when Mr. Mazzola would drink a cup of corn oil and say, it's great stuff, it lowers your cholesterol. And he unfortunately died at a very young age of a heart attack. So it caused such an arterial blockage. But basically they needed to sell their oils and they boycotted all tropical oils, the palm and the coconut oils, which will not cause heart attacks, and promoted corn oil. And there you have it. Now well, what everyone... about olive oil? Olive oil is only 90%, um, only 10% polyunsaturated and 90% monounsaturated. So it is not going to block your arteries like the other liquid oils. But, of course, you wouldn't want to use it in excessive amounts because it still is 10% polyunsaturated. So you're saying that butter is, is the healthiest or, or coconut oil? Butter, coconut, palm. Okay, thank you. And uh, right. saturated fats from okay. animals like beef and lamb. Okay, thanks for your call. We have uh, another caller on the air, so let's get this next one. Oh, yes, hi, George from Kentucky. Hey, George, thanks for joining us from Kentucky. Uh, my question is, is twofold. I've been reading um, about uh, black tourmaline or organite, 
um, as being helpful or effective against EMS, and I was curious to know what, what you felt was um, helpful or protective um, in fighting against EMS. Okay, are those like those beads that you can put on the end of your cable? Is that what you're talking about? No, it's black tourmaline is a stone. He's not talking about the. Uh, but don't uh, they make the, beads out of the it? antenna blockers? No, that's uh, that's a different compound. That's graphene or gra- uh, not graphene? I think it's graphite. Yeah. It's, a, it's a it's a crystal. Mm-hmm. Doctor Pete, for, la- for a laptop, you know, with, with the ele- electromagnetic field, you get the um, uh, you know a harmful. Um, electromagnetic field, so I was curious if you felt the crystals were, were effective in... in um, blocking that? Uh, uh, blocking that, exactly. No, it, it takes something that is uh, basically uh, covering the space between you and the source uh, geometrically. Uh, something that is a small area just can't catch a broad uh, emission coming at you. So it's like they, they have these things called block socks for your cell phone. So this, the side of your cell phone that has an antenna that radiates to get its signal, if you put that block sock that has this metal barrier next to your body and the phone faces out, then it's not going to be penetrating you the same way as if you didn't have that block sock. Does that okay, make sense? So, so I guess just to reiterate, how, how do we exactly protect ourselves from EMF of the laptop computer then? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow. I understood the analogy for for cell phones, but I didn't quite understand for, for a laptop. Uh, just think of it as light that's coming uh, from your uh, computer or whatever. And uh, if the light is uh, touching some important part of your body, uh, the, the uh, rays, whatever they are, microwaves, uh, are going to be following the line of sight. So you need something basically as big as the object emitting to catch the radiation. I see. Okay. So uh, w- would you suggest, like, if it, would you suggest just placing the laptop on, on a table or a surface um, um, and not obviously using it um, yeah. on top of your lap? say, on a pillow or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the lap is not a good place to keep a radiant <laughs> source. But potentially, you see, you could use an external keyboard on your laptop and then put the laptop underneath the table or in a slot like that to block, block the EMF from the laptop and then use a monitor also connected to your laptop. You could just use your laptop as the, the processor. And you can get a little EMF monitor, and you can see on your laptop it reads danger. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And six inches away, it doesn't pick up any EMF. I mean, that's a, a real rough, crude monitor you can buy at the hardware store. But, you know, keep it as far away from your body as possible, basically. Okay. All right, excellent. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your help. Yeah, thank you for your call. Your call. Okay, Bye. I don't know if there's anybody else uh, waiting. Okay, so we, we're getting very close to the top of the hour anyway. So. Uh, we could make a connection between the connections about the unsaturated fat and the uh, the fact that fish oil right. happens to be one of the <laughs> very best activators yeah. of the heme oxygenase, which makes carbon monoxide. And in proportion to how polyunsaturated the fat is, it activates the production of carbon monoxide. So to, if someone had Alzheimer's and they're taking fish oil, it's a really Worse bad combination. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that I would imagine most of the industry is telling you is good for Alzheimer's and uh, good for um, chronic obstruct- obstructive lung disease and uh, things like uh, uh, atrial uh, fibrillation and other, other uh, cardiovascular disorders. Bizarre. We have one quick question about horse meat. Is that good or bad? It depends on what the horse is eating, but um, uh, it'll reflect exactly what the horse ate. Uh, so it's uh, very likely to be fairly unsaturated, unless in in uh, some countries they they feed them. For example, dates were a major food in Iraq, uh, and they would have a very saturated fat if they ate dates. Okay, so let's um, let's wrap the show up by giving people some of your uh, contact details, Dr. Pete. Thanks so much for joining us again. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Raymond Pete, uh, he's been working on uh, many things surrounding uh, current, what are becoming very current health topics and um, the uh, polyunsaturated oils are one of his mainstays, but he's done lots of research into things that are surrounding cancer treatment. Um, so his website is www.raypeat.com, R-A-Y, P-E-A-T.com. He has lots of articles there that you can go and browse. Many of it, well, they're all fully referenced. Uh, some are quite difficult to get into because they're very scientific, but there's lots of uh, information in there that most people will find the truth of behind. Thank you for joining us. My name's Sarah Murray. My name's Andrew.